Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Best of All Worlds podcast here on the Nerds of Rose channel. Uh, I am joined, as ever, by my illustrious co-host, uh, the man to know, Jerry Soul, Captain Soul, to his friends. Um, Jerry, it's a very exciting time for us because uh, on this arc of absolute confirmed banger episodes, we have reached our uh, turning point, as it were, as we're moving from one arc to the other. Um, so, in a sense, it's a bit of a crossover episode because we have had character defining episodes for the last uh, few weeks and now we're going to time oriented episodes so why not do an episode that does both character defining yeah. and is all about time you want me bullshit which is why ironically enough we're caught we're going for the episode called timeless um but that's not the whole story because uh in the as well as the behind the scenes part of it is that uh this was a Voyager's 100 episode and they wanted to do something mm -hmm. special so what they did was essentially was kill off most of the cast which was you know interesting which, yeah which is is always fun to do you know yeah, yeah. um I, I i couldn't tell you how many times uh next generation did it jesus they were blowing up that ship uh three or four times a season the, the, yeah that was, as i say that's the cause and effect typically it was just yeah, like cause and effect over and over every three that's, weeks. A, that's a great episode cause and effect a great episode mm -hmm. and of course by the end of it you get kelsey grammar you're like ooh. Yeah. <laughs> you know? It's just out of nowhere. It's like, oh, there. And, and suddenly, here's here's Frasier. Just surprise yeah. Frasier out of nowhere. Yeah. I, I, I'm wondering, actually, because uh, Next Gen started, what, 88, 89? Yeah. And uh, obviously, that would have been that would have been on the same time as Friends. Not Sorry, yes. not Friends. Um, uh, cheers. cheers. Mm. So Cheers would have been on at that time. So I'm like, don't think Frasier had started yet. But he was obviously in Cheers. He was in Cheers, when, so yeah. When you look at him, actually, in that episode, he has the, he has the beard, uh, mm. but he has most of his, well, still a lot of his hair. Whereas in, in, right, when yeah. he first started Frasier, he, he still had the hair and no beard. So I'm like, I'm trying to pinpoint exactly when it was Frasier start yet, or, but I, I would have liked to see him be like a recurring character. I would have loved well, that. Well, here's the here's the gas thing about it, uh, Jerry, is that in canon, in well, <clears throat> in um, beta canon, as it were, um. Kelsey Grammer, or rather uh, Captain Bozeman, is actually the uh, captain who took the Enterprise E out on its um, on its uh, excursion, on its uh, test voyage. Oh, before Picard and Co uh, take over from there. So he actually is the uh, the um, the they do the their opening their first cruise. That's it. Something like that. They have to use a term for it. I just can't remember what the actual yeah. name shakedown is, cruise. Shakedown cruise. Thank you, Jerry. Yes. That's what now, it was. Did you, did you say he was Captain Bozeman or was it the USS Bozeman? Um, it was. I yeah, it was, I, no, know right. Bozeman, it was, I know. I know one of them is it's yeah. Bozeman. One of them. Yeah. 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 Mm. That's it. He was. He was Captain Batesman or Bates, something like that. Yeah. Well, oh, yeah, once, well <laughs> wouldn't he, once he wasn't a master. That well, that's it. exactly. It's a good thing he wasn't. No, he's Captain Morgan Bateson of the Bozeman. That's there where there you getting. go. That's it. Too many sons there, but yeah. Um, there, so Fre yeah, and to actually, answer your question. Cause and effect actually comes out in '92. Fraser starts a year after. So ah, I see. That's the the power of Google and and me not even seeing you type. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it's all off camera. It's just like yeah. Continue on. Keep talking, Jerry. <laughs> I tell I tell you what, isn't it great to have a staff? Well, that's it. It's, it's great when you have the staff. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> that, I tell you that that Tina, she has really fast paws. Oh, I tell you, it's it's, it's great when you have a. I'll just pretend to nod to a producer. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Rebecca. Um, uh, I think he was then also... You do, then you just he was like a bomb at this time as well. Yeah. <laughs> just like a white fur bomb. Just... <laughs> <laughs> I think my producer just resigned. Um, <laughs> I don't know why. She actually turned around to talk to me there when I, when I said that. Anyway, we are digressing here. So, um, the episode Timeless, as you said, is a timey wimey episode. It is something special for Voyager's 100 episode. But it does center around a certain character. Um, one of the, I suppose, the, the regular um, members of the cast, and that is Harry Kim, played by the excellent uh, Gareth Wong. So Harry Kim is kind of like a reoccurring joke of the series in a sense, where like, no matter what this guy does, no matter how many things times he saves the day, he'll always be the Ensign. Um, which is hilarious because pretty much in every alternate future, Ensign just being a captain anyway. So it's, anything, it's, just, it's just delaying the inevitable. But throughout the entire run of Voyager, like Tom Paris gets promoted and demoted twice, and it's like similar things happen to Belana Torres and fucking the holographic doctor ends up becoming an actual normal person. And people basically outrank Kim in the grand scheme of things. And yet 
he's always a go-to for Janeway. He's always a go-to for certain people as well. But yet, he's always still uh, ensign by rank. Which so it was, it was always going to be an oversight with the writers, I guess, to to not uh, give him a field promotion when he, well, like I said, other people have had done. But um, but I suppose in terms of the even, actual even, episode even itself, Tuvok, even Tuvok got promoted. He was a lieutenant when it started, and then he was, became yeah, lieutenant right. commander. You know, mm. some like Jesus, they couldn't even make him a, a junior grade lieutenant. No. That's the thing. Like, it's just like Jesus. It's like, you can do lieutenant to lieutenant, but like, sorry, no, that's uh, what, you what a what application course. What I find hilarious is, is that um, over seven seasons he couldn't even be made a junior grade lieutenant, and over yeah. three seasons Nog went from uh, cadet to ensign to lieutenant in three seasons. Like, in, in three seasons, yeah. Like in, in five seasons, he was a, from street urchin to <laughs> to bar to bar staff to cadet. Like that's yeah. that's that that's what you call character progression. In a nutshell, mm-hmm. but um, but yes, this episode is all about him uh, and how he basically writes the wrongs of the past and all this sort of stuff. It's a bit of a fun watch. It's a, it's definitely one of those kind of like um movie plots like bunched into a uh, a TV episode. Um, mm-hmm. kind of like the way I would describe it, and I, this will come up a lot in my uh, summary of the episode. This is Voyager's attempt at yesterday's Enterprise for me. Um, and kind of similar episodes like that where like the, the future's been fucked and now we're trying to unfuck it essentially that's the way I describe it um, so uh, let's see if it actually holds up to the um, to the other ones Jerry are you ready to start this exciting episode? I'm ready to go excellent so again guys as the name implies this is the best of both worlds so this is both a watch along and a review of the episode so if you want to watch along the uh, episode with us then uh, press play them when we do on your streaming device of choice and you can uh, listen to our uh, commentary over the episode as well. If not, then skip 45 minutes and then you'll hear our uh, notes on the episode along with the actual review of it. And we'll see how it ranks up with the episodes that we've done already on this series. So with that then, with the itinerary done and everyone ready to start, I shall count us in on three, two, one. Ungage. On go- I knew you were going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> you fucking knew I was going to say it. <laughs> Because I was going to say it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just because it's a Voyager episode, so you know. It is a Voyager episode, yes. This is what, ha- this is what would have happened to Bourgeois State instead of Mulgrew. Just immediately crashed on a snowy planet at the end. They all died in Nova Scotia. Oh. <laughs> and what, I don't, what I don't understand, though, is, right? So this is, what, 30 years later? 25 years later? Something like that? 25 years, yeah. Uh, they're still wearing the same fucking outfits. Of twenty five years later, tricorders haven't changed. Tri tricorders have uh, been perfected to a mirror sheen. Now, in fairness, I much prefer the kind of Voyager DS nine Voyager version of a tricorder, even mm. the Nemesis version of a tricorder, um, yeah. and then the the various future iterations of them uh, during the episodes and whatnot, because mm. they they look cool, they sound cool. Um, I know there's a guy on Instagram that makes them. That they're, they're, yeah. it's fantastic. It looks Whereas the newer, the newer stuff, the likes of Discovery and then even Picard, a lot of the stuff I don't like. You know, the weapons I don't like. The tricorders I don't like. Mm. Badges. The 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 last episode, Picard badge, the gold one is beautiful. Yeah, absolutely beautiful. There we go. Yeah, I can. I, you can actually see the obviously. Took a lot of uh, uh, creative license from all the future episodes. So yeah. next generation um, wasn't that many Deep Space Nine future ones. I think there was only it was really only wasn't. One. There was we, we we watched the Visitor, which was a a brief <laughs> encounter into it, but that wasn't that many. No, mm, it was only the one. Yeah. So the only the, mm. the only future one that you obviously saw was was that one, and it was the same yeah. typical badge that you would see in all the like, they, they, like, they tend to go with the same template they always seem to revert yeah. back to the arrowheads and keep it basic yeah. which is oh, it's fair, always fair. it's always going to be the arrowhead it will always yeah. be the arrowhead no matter what or or some sort of iteration of the arrowhead um, exactly. the arrowhead is always going to be there because that's essentially that is star trek that's what it is it's been there it's the one thing that has not changed in 60 mm. years of star trek is the arrowhead it's always yeah. going to be there you're going to have different looks of starships. You're going to have different looks of cash. You're going to have different technologies and different weapons. And, uh, you know, everything is going to change. You know, yeah. People were saying, like, oh, Picard has changed so much from the next generation. I'm sorry, but have you, have you seen the difference between the original series and next generation? 
Yeah, that's a, that's a jump up. Completely like. different. Everything's completely yeah. different. But you just you go with the flow, you know. Um, but you have to move on. You do have to yeah, change. Exactly. Yeah, things. you do Especially have to move on. Yeah, when you are actively trying to make a show that's different. Well, in season one excluded, of course, because he pretty much just recycled plots. But they're a show that aesthetically looks different to mm. the original series, and then mm. obviously mm. they kind of fuck it with like um, scripts written out of the nineteen sixties. But they do get they do grow out of the habit when they actually put in some actual writers and mm. loosen the kind of rules on um, on Roddenberry. Uh, um, kind of uh, style of stories, but even with the with jumps into like you know, decent and Voyager being done at the same time, were people really kind of complaining about the, sh- the, sh- the ships looking a bit differently and all that jazz? They were like, these are something was like, oh, this this is on can't this can't work, it's on a spaceship, it's on the Enterprise, you know, yeah, everyone finds great, everyone's a critic in a sense. I do like as well, like just in the in the pre the preemptive thing is that the, the first clue that this is the future is the actual futuristic badge and then yeah. you have the reveal of the of the voyager that is subtle subtly done and i like it you can already tell as well immediately as soon as he starts speaking you know it's kim yeah exactly <laughs> and the one thing that changes him is his voice yeah because he's gone because he's kind of gone gravelly he's like and- snake from uh uh metal gear, metal gear solid you know uh, my name is harry kim I'm trying. I'm trying to be like Christian Bale, Batman. I'm looking for a man called Tom Paris. It was a Versailles. I can't remember. <laughs> be fair, if he was being snake, he'd actually just like repeat all the dialogue, but in a question. Backed it. Full impulse. Full impulse. <laughs> if this was if, if this was a less serious episode the uh, main computer should like wake up just like shivering it's like <laughs> <laughs> ah! where are they <laughs> okay guys don't disturb the baby powder we got the snow just right cut Come on, guys. We have to do this again. Tim Russ sneezed. There's a tremendous amount of effort to make everything frosty, isn't it? Yeah. Like this is all like done like presume like give really quick turnaround to get the get the shots you need and then just suddenly sweep off the fake snow immediately. I'm assuming that's that's Paris there, isn't it? Yeah. That's Paris there, yeah. Yeah. And again, the sad foreboding music to suit. And yet, you know the shit this episode would be taken seriously because there's unique music for it, which is all we wanted from these episodes sometimes. Yeah. There she is. Yeah. Now we're starting to see that uh, the uh, the whole as opposed to the whole gist of it is just like, ooh, this is interesting. I like it. Mm-hmm. These are our automatic microwaves to warm everything up. Go to the Tessa. Go ahead. I found her. I found her the transporter relay and beam her to the lab. Stand by. Make it quick. This isn't exactly the half of the union. Thank you. I got a lot. So, again, not not when to explain anything to you first, though. Mm. Which is uh, interesting. Long time no see. I go by Harry now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not taking that line seriously. That's terrible. My name is Harry. Yeah. Okay. Mm. <laughs> All you need at that moment is flashbacks. Oh, it's the warp core's birthday. Yay. 
for he's a dilithium relay for he's a dilithium relay for it's a dilithium relay warp one engage 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 Tim Ruck. Tim Ross approves. Ah, oh, they said the line, Jerry. So that dates it quite well. It stands for frontiers of exploration, and more importantly, it survives. Now it's time to go home. Enjoy the celebration, but keep in mind we still have a lot of work to do before tomorrow's life. Build your little mission. Quanta Matrix, Denonite Digital, Borg Technology, the United Star Trek Joint Set. Gotta say it's a whole lot of bollocks, Captain. I'm probably nominated for the Cochran Medal of Honor. I'll get working on my acceptance speech. <laughs> I'd like to thank the Borg Collective. Dinner plan? Nothing special. Take you the replicator. Cancel it. That's an order. Hi, Captain. <laughs> so, so one time that Jacoti was actually an important character. Thanks. What is it? A collection An old space tradition. Thanks. I I love it. I stuffed it myself. I don't think I've ever the heard a more the backhanded fact that compliments. Ne yeah, the fact that Neelix never mm. really got what he was saying. <laughs> no, didn't want to know. This is like it's like that kind of coworker that like, you know, like he's on like, just a completely different like wave at you and just like go, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh, she's getting drunk. Well, Sin the hall. Yeah, get that woman an actual drink. I thought I thought Sin the hall couldn't get you drunk. Exactly, it doesn't. So how the fuck is she drunk? Because the boar can't handle their booze. Then there'll be no narcissist. We are at one. We are at one. <laughs> Compare that to what she's like in Picard, where she's like drinking bourbon straight. Like, this is like, yeah. when are you going to join the party? Two minutes. Two minutes. You're running a warp core diagnostic now? Harry, you built an Edsel. A lemon. A disaster waiting to happen. In simulation, it's never been discovered. 142 phase variance in the slipstream pressure. 142. So it'll be a bumpy ride. We've flown through warp. We get knocked out of that slipstream mid flight. We overload the quantum matrix. Spoil the festivities of the function. It'll make me feel better. We'll go to the holiday flight now and run a few more simulations. I love that you can like date the scene because they all have confetti. That's that's how they do it. Feel stable. Flicker's active. Slipstream velocity in four, three, two. Mm. Rapid is steady. At which point, of course, when they enter the slipstream, they'll go. <laughs> 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 They're going exactly eighty-eight warp. Miles per hour. Warp 88, yeah. Cutting down the drive. I don't know, wait, that's why I didn't work the field. It's no use. The slipstream is collapsing. I'm not sure. We're losing structural integrity. Computer freeze program. One more time. I think we reroute emergency power to the deflector a little earlier. Don't help. Computer, restart simulation at time index. Computer, belay that order. It's no use, Harry. Skip up. 23 simulations, 23 catastrophes. 
This is no censor question. That, that one great victim of everything, human error. Sorry. Follow that too. Run them for yourself. I am sober now, by the way. Try to take that flight from Hawaii. We'll be in a speed box by afternoon. It would appear we have no choice but to cancel it. Would you like me to abandon the concert? Got an idea. It's tricky, but I think it could work. The trouble begins about 17 seconds into the flight. The phase variance kicks in, and the slipstream becomes unstable. Yeah, and it wouldn't be a so top tier uh, Star Trek episode if it wasn't just full of techno babble, and I appreciate it. Now, here's the tricky part. The shuttle will only be a couple of seconds ahead of work. That doesn't give auto navigation much time to compensate. A couple of seconds? We can do this yet. Put me on the shuttle. I'll get Voyager through the slipstream. Ooh, I wonder what happens next. What choice do we have? They did it. Yeah, technically. Ish. Venomite crystals at the heart of this issue have already started to decay. It could take years to synthesize more. <laughs> could take years to synthesize something that doesn't exist? Just to be stopped by a point four two phase variance. Convince me. Prepare a flight plan. I'm my best believe. Now, I suppose, like, this is a kind of a small character trait as well, but it hasn't well established by the point of season five that Harry Kim is very homesick mm. and he's left a lot behind. So this is now like the in a weird way, he's kind of accepted the fact he was always going to be in the in the bed in the Delta Quadrant, but now this is an opportunity to actually get back home and yeah. he's jumping at it. Programmed additional room that they used to make back on Earth. That should be for him. That doesn't sound Irish. I love the fact that she has a house in Donegal. Yeah, it's gas, isn't it? <laughs> After dessert. We're just two men away. Something goes wrong that six months. We are in a chance to use the clutch again. But if we sort this data to the project engineer. You are. Find another way. Oh fuck off! <laughs> actually, I actually I like it here in the Delta Quadrant. Present on the cookie. I'll let you <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 I enjoy that line. That was good. And scene transit. Oh, they didn't have a perfect. Mm. It's like, yeah. Where well, I suppose, I suppose it wouldn't have been, but would have been nice to get it like for like. Nice idea, though. Mm. There you guys are answer, Jay. Fifteen years, not twenty-five. There you go. Just outside the Alpha Quadrant. The crew, except for us, dead. We think Captain Jane will try to make it to the three landing on this planet. The ship must have been too heavily damaged. Oh, look at that grey streak. Just getting a point just for that. Not the point of a bigger voyage. 
you made it all the way back to Earth. We got home now, kid. It only took this killing of him to get you Harry, come back. You can tell he's kind of taking it personally. Starfleet gave up their search for Voyager over nine years ago. We had to find you on our own. Stayed in the deep freeze forever. We're not here to salvage your program. We're here to prevent this disaster from ever happening. You see, Doc, 15 years ago, I miscalculated the slipstream pressure. Transmitted the wrong phase corrections to Voyager. They were not about the slipstream. Sent two hours of death and three months of care. Again, has very much taken it personally. <laughs> You have to imagine that Garrett, that Garrett Wong was just absolutely dying to do this episode when he found that it was coming up. He's like, I get to be the edgy anti-hero? Fucking sign me up! Do, 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 do I get to wear leather jackets? You, you can have the leather jackets. Good to know that the like the Borg hasn't killed everybody at this stage, so you know that's that's handy. Her cybernetic implants disengaged from her organic systems. Her time of death down to milliseconds. See what I can do. <laughs> it would have been funny if he knocked out the holonator as he did that. It's like, oh, oh, oh no. We killed him. Shit, we broke the duck. Yeah. I entered a low orbit and remodulated our shields, but nothing on the planet found us. Six hours of the lab we can. Don't get this straight. Your computer games. Can you not tell from the jacket? You stole the Delta. <laughs> oh, that's why um, he's in this episode. They stole from his fucking museum. Motherfuckers. <laughs> they stole from the fucking museum. I wonder, actually, because we know Voyager does end up in the museum. Yeah. So what does actually happen to the Delta Flyer? Is that there as well? or I presume it's probably just stuck, docked in the, in, the, in the shuttle bay. It's not like an interactive, uh, play, interactive ride. <laughs> I'd, like think, I'd, like think, you know, I'd like to think that, okay, she gave up her ship. Yeah. But she might not have given up the Delta Flyer. Interesting kind, of, kind, kind, kind of like, you know, uh, all good things. You know, Riker yeah. couldn't give up the Enterprise D, so he decided to make it the Enterprise DX. Red That's true. Yeah. That's a good point, actually. So you think you reckon that maybe uh, Lieutenant Commander Paris is uh, just having adventures around space in his little speedy oh, boy? N oh, no, no, no. Janeway has it. Janeway. <laughs> Janeway goes, I'm an admiral, bitch. I can do what I want. Yeah. Yeah, in fairness, he's got. She's got a point there. She like, can. I, I, I would imagine she was. She is in uh, command of. Um, it's the Enterprise, uh, the Voyager B. Yes. It's amazing though, they went through three Voyagers in thirty years. <laughs> if you keep crashing them, that's what's gonna happen. True. I mean, look how look how long the fucking Enterprise F lasted. It was just like, dude, did nothing bad happen to it? It was just made bad. In it fairness, just... the Enterprise the Enterprise F lasted sixteen years. Was it sixteen years? It's sixteen years. It was commissioned in nineteen right. uh, nineteen twenty three eighty five, and uh, it would finish up in uh, twenty four oh two. Okay, so the shortest stint then is either C and E then, isn't it? You okay. E lasted from seventy two to eighty four. So that's okay. Twelve years. And then the C, the C was yeah, the I think the C was the was the shortest one. 
It was the shortest one, yeah. Because then, yeah, he gets uh, attacked at them. Um... Okay. Because when you look at it, the the original or what not the original, but the one mm. that just before A was what 30, 40 years old. About that, yeah. Now that's if you count like the retrofits as if it's the same ship or not, I suppose. But yeah, so technically speaking, yeah, it's the same ship. It's the same ship. It was just retrofitted. Yeah, exactly. um, it's kind. It's kind of like the Titan. Mm. Uh, the yeah. Titan, and obviously uh, Enterprise G. Now the Titan is um, it, it does parts of it came from both the original Shangri La Titan, yes. and the USS Titan, which was a, a Riker ship. So yes, but what I want to know is, I want to know the, f- the official specs. They still haven't done it yet. I want to know the official specs of that ship. I want to know how many decks, how big she is, how many weapons she's got. Mm. I want to know it all because when you compare it to the Enterprise F, it's it's nothing. <laughs> it's a, it's it's a mar- yeah. it's basically an a, a, to me it's like an Obert being being compared to uh, a Galaxy Glass. It's it's mm. ridi- it's ridiculous. Like, no, that's fair. Like, it's I think it's also kind of seen like I don't know if, if Enterprise is still considered the flagship at that point, or is it like is there a different dynamic? You'd assume it is still the flagship, but you you would it's... assume. But you the, the, there was the Shangri La Titan. Yeah, what was the flagship for two years mm-hmm. while they made the Enterprise B? Yeah, yeah. So to go going from Enterprise A to Enterprise B took a couple of years. So um, the Shangri La was actually the Shangri La Titan, I should say, was yeah. actually the flagship of the Federation. And and boy, what what a ship it was! It was mm-hmm. basically a Constitution photon boat. Yeah, they they had photon torpedoes directly in the front of the saucer section. That was a kick ass, <laughs> absolutely kick ass ship. What, the, the, hell ha- what the hell happened to the A? Like Jesus, it probably blew itself up because it sounds overpowered. Well, no, that's it. They 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 put the Shangri La, uh, the Titan, uh, Titan and the 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 old Titan and the new Titan together to make the Titan A. Yeah, that's essentially it. They took it out of mothballs and and put the two of them together. Seven's so, a good eye. Well, yeah, that's very well done. Lovely eyes. <laughs> lovely eyes. She always had pretty eyes. See, I like the idea is like because she's like so frozen, the doctor was going to go, okay, Grant, tick. Oh, there we have it. Lovely. How does a child a Vulcan children's choir work? Is it just like uh emotion? That's literally a... At least he was buried under twenty meters of ice. If it's in conservation, I'm doing better. I will say one thing about future Harry Kim. That hair. Excellent. Yeah. Just just so close to the mullet. But not without without saying it, saying it's welcome. Bastards. This that Adam McIntyre sounds like a bollocks. Mm-hmm. Oh, please marry my daughter. Oh, no, please leave me alone. The Voyager's dead. It's not coming back. Well, you'd think the, the one that you'd actually go to 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 help would be Admiral Paris, wouldn't you? You assume so, wouldn't you? Then again, he probably wouldn't like the idea of being told his son is buried under 20 fucking feet of ice. Mm-hmm. This timeline only exists because I made a mistake 15 years ago. The crew trusted in me and I left. It's a very small thing, but um, this Harry Kim has not blinked once. Mm. 
Very subtle. But he's like very like very say, Wednesday Adams. A little bit, but he's 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 shown off the intensity of the character, and that's actually it's it's well appreciated. Yeah. Now what we're about to see now is I would have liked a nod to this ship mm. in in Picard. Yes. Because of what Perfect. happens. The salsa section of the Enterprise on the star drive of this ship would have been that the icing been cool. of the cake for me. It was like that is a great throwback. But you can't mm. uh, you can't have it all, unfortunately. No. As well as well, it is an alter timeline, so mm. you know, you could train change one ship for another, I guess. Yeah. But yeah. I know I just I just like the the fact that I just like the fact that it's a galaxy clash. It's my favorite. That's class the best ship. part of this, isn't it? It's just oh you sent him. Jordy Jor- was like, go on, you fucking beauty. Yeah. yeah. Now you look at the Delta Flyer there compared to Voyager and like where's it go? Yeah. Where does it go? Exactly. Yeah, they like, never get they never what, get the scaling They words. never get the scaling right. And, well now Voyager is better at scaling than D Space Nine because my Jesus did they Very get true. it wrong yeah. so many times. In fairness, like Voyager does have that massive fucking shuttle bay, but it's just you need the perspective is just not right at all. Yeah, well, it has a massive shuttle bay, but you have to understand that houses what two or three shuttles, the Delta Flyer, and Neelix's ship. Yeah, that's not exactly, exactly a big ship. Come on, Voyager really, is not really, big. Really. And this is where it all goes wrong. Like even oh. the scaling there, it wouldn't even fit in the in 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 that. Yeah, <laughs> I love the I love the transition there. That was tremendous. They're hailing us. You want to talk to them? Require some time. Open the gem. <laughs> Challenge. And by the way, directed the episode as well. Mm-hmm. Incidentally, the previous one he did to this before this episode was the Pegasus. Oh, wow. Yeah. LeVar Le- 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 Burton has a tremendous pedigree of directing episodes on Star Trek. I, I, I'm assuming that this was made around about the time of one of the Next Generation films. It's not too far away, actually. I think it would have been first contact would be the closest, or possibly insurrection. It probably is insurrection because by this time they'd seen the Borg in the Delta Quadrant, and it was the yeah. new style Borg they had introduced in, in first contact. So I'd imagine it's insurrection. It must be insurrection then, yeah. Definitely on Nemesis because that was around there. Uh, that was before Enterprise. Yeah. He's such a good actor, though. I love, I honestly love that dynamic. I know we talked over it a little bit, but that is absolutely fucking excellent. Yeah. There's an actual genuine dignity and respect between the two. Just ideologically different, and they have to, one has a job to do, and one is following their heart. And that's just, yeah. I love that. Absolutely brilliant scene. Engage. Engage. Oh, It's a galaxy class. What do you expect? You're kind of fucked, yeah. Never mind, this is all the one of the galaxy class that survived the Dominion War. So, yeah, it's pretty fucking good. It's still holding up. Yeah, it turns out Harry, you couldn't. 
I love the fact though that when you're on Voyager and you hear them pressing buttons, it's the yeah. typical like uh next generation Deep Space Nine Voyager sound. But when they're on the Delta Flyer, it's yeah. so much more like uh the modern like uh, Nemesis Nemesis movie, yeah. movie one sounds, yeah. Yeah, it's like it's like they use the unupdated L cars that they had around essentially. Yeah. They're able to synthesize them. But the sounds are just it, the sounds are different. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's like it's like it sounds like um the Prometheus. Yes, that's what it sounds like. Good shout, yeah. Well, it checks out. Like it was a concept ship, yeah. so that makes sense. Telemetry's down too. Slipstream's destabilizing. Shut down the drive. I can't. There's some kind of overload in the quantum matrix. I've lost helm control. We're terminated on Stargate 5216423. Old time index 9.4.8.5.2. Nice. Numbers. I love the fact that he's just pressing the same four buttons. Four buttons. <laughs> the fact that it's like the actual like the the, the L cars, even the Delta Flyer just hasn't been touched in fifteen years. Mm. You know, and they were smart enough to not show anything in them. In the challenger to say that it's been changed either. Oh. Shield the maximum hold of the steady job. It's no use. We're losing attitude control. Okay. Mm-hmm. They must have remained in the slipstream. Voyager's been thrown into normal space. Alter our slipstream course. We've got to go back. We can't. Even if they survive, we have to evict velocity. What can you say? We've got to find them. There's no choice. Drama. Yeah, I love question. the fact that they're actually showing you what happened. Yes, but there's gonna be well, there's gonna be a difference here, isn't there? Because they basically warped into solid ice. No, it should be. It should be the same. It should be the same. It, should, it? Yeah. it should be the same. Yeah. Because I don't, I don't think it's a matter of they warped into ice. It's that they crash land the exact same way. Yeah, just over, fi- over over fifteen it, yeah. years, it just got impacted and covered in ice. Mm. Yeah, that's true. That makes more sense. Yeah, I just don't understand why every single one of them died during the crash. That- oh, now I <laughs> now I do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's like bunk. Fair points. Fair points. Fair points. Oh, that was why. Because that that wasn't like the Enterprise uh, D saucer section in the soft ground. like me. Yeah, that was a bang. Oh, here yes. we go. Ooh, look at the ship. <laughs> look at you. You get so giddy. <laughs> I love. I fucking love that ship. I do love that you just give any excuse to just show a galaxy class in other works. Like, oh god, yes. I'm hoping what will what what will happen is if we do get this Titan series, not Titan, uh, legacy, uh, yeah. legacy series, that we're going to see a bit more of the Ross class. That would be great because uh, it's because it's the it's the perfect love child of a galaxy and a sovereign. Like, oh yes. Mm. Mm. If you want to remember that shit, I'll understand. You want to remember that shit? Dirt. <laughs> <laughs> That's disgusting. The test isn't going to be better. 
don't know what to tell them. Three clinics of life, hyperdimensional progression. Maybe it's such a pleasure, John. You've had 15 years to think about this, Harry. Woohoo. Look at that. <laughs> Don't touch the challenger. It's perfect. I mean, it looks okay for me. And there's the character moment. Some of that counts as thinking outside the box. You only got 45 seconds, like, there's no rush. We can do this all again in 15 years. <laughs> he repeats the like oh, yeah, slap you back with your powers combined. <laughs> Fuck off. Oh, <laughs> Kaboom. <laughs> Love it. Oh dear. Oh no, how terrible. We're still alive. Oh, it's a ghost. Mass confusion. <laughs> they're looking at her, they're looking at her going, you bitch. <laughs> <laughs> they want to throw into the brig. It's like you ruined it. Is it called the same stuff as what uh, the Protostar is now, isn't it? Or is it a... Yeah, so, so they obviously do... Um, I won't say perfect it, but they obviously do... They're able to use it. Uh, yeah. But it's, it's, it, it's obvious it's not widespread throughout the yeah, Starfleet it's, yet. It's still uh, in the concept phase, yeah. Yeah, so we, we'll, we will see again in a legacy show, maybe. We'll Hopefully. see. Or the next series of uh, Prodigy. Prodigy, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's the uh, trademark Janeway eyebrow. <laughs> the 
Perhaps somewhere in the middle, perhaps 15 years. How could I send the message to the place I can't see it? My advice is making sense of temporal paradox. <laughs> <laughs> I hate temporal mechanics. Hmm. Unlike every other time, you little bollocks. <laughs> you fucking little ensign. And then there's no 15 years later, he's still an ensign. Can I cast this device? The answer is yes. Wow, in the future I get to wear a cool leather jacket? <laughs> that makes up for the Jensen business altogether. <laughs> in, in, in fairness, let's be honest, he looks like a marquee. He does, and that's the kind of the energy it, it is as well. It's like, yeah, fuck the Federation. Fuck, the, fuck those guys. I want to save the future. So, <laughs> yeah, that's the episode. It certainly doesn't have to say it's welcome anyway. Um, but there's a lot of a, um, a nice little emotional punch at the end there. Uh, and no doubt Harry Kim will use that in his day-to-day uh, -day business and it'll inspire him to uh, qualify for uh, ranks higher than Ensign in the future. Moving on. So, uh, <laughs> Whatever you say. Yes, absolutely. I am always wrong. But um, with that then, uh, Jerry, that is the end of Timeless. How did you enjoy that episode? Again, a bit of a, a, bit of a celebration of Voyager, 100 episodes in. Well, Hundred episode in, uh, the old timey, uh, the old timey wimey stuff is good. Um, mm. for, for me though, uh, I think when it comes to uh, you know the individual, um, the individual uh, character episodes, mm. uh, obviously every show gets them, but for me, uh, Voyager got more. Than any yes. other show, they got more. So instead of having two or three uh, episodes centralized around one particular character, uh, Jesus, they must have got five or six or seven each in in, yeah. in Voyager. And I think more more so than anybody was was Harry Kim. He got loads, mm. absolutely loads, centralized around him. But out of them all, I think this was the best. It's the best yeah. Harry Kim centric episode. Uh, the other ones. For me, I just found annoying. Yeah, and they I, were I found annoying. They weren't adding that much to him in the end because of exactly, yeah. As in a the, sense, the the other ones. There was one where he was, he went back in time. He was still on Earth. He never left with Voyager. The other one where he was actually, uh, he wasn't actually human. He was a completely different race from oh, the Delta yeah. Quadrant. There yeah. was that one. There was the various love episodes that he was involved in. I'm like, oh, will you fuck off? Yeah. Th this this yeah. one had a little bit it had a little bit more. It was a little bit better. And like, yeah. I yeah, I'd be happy. I'd be happy enough with that. Um it was it was good. It was exciting. Um ever just, you know, ever so slight bits of action. Just a little little bit 
but it was enough for me because obviously this episode wasn't about action it was about different things yes uh, no I, I think very good episode a good Voyager episode best Harry Kim episode and let's be honest there was a galaxy class in it it's 10 out of 10 for me <laughs> that, that is always going to ha- that is always going to uh, win out for us in that sense but um but yeah, literally, you was, give me um, an episode that has galaxy class ships in it, and it will autom- automatically could be a shite episode, but if there's a galaxy class in it, it's already ranked high in my opinion. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's totally fair, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that's um, that's got my takeaway from this ep- from this uh, episode as well is that it's it's one of those episodes, it's one of those editions where it actually added something to to Harry Kim's um, character, but in a weird way. It's kind of it's it's almost like the the bit of the character that's not fle- that isn't fleshed out yet because again his character arc isn't started yet in a sense he's still an ensign for intents and purpose he's still the young guy and again a lot of the stories that are centered around him still kind of live in that in that bubble but at least this is something that like we can say okay this is what he will become and we can point to that and and get really excited about it but yeah. we digress we will talk about this all in the um, in the review until we get to our little bits. Um, not much actually, Jerry, because as we said, from our um, adventures of this episode, we've already seen the Voyager, the Intrepid class. We've already seen the Delta Flyer, and we've already seen the uh, Galaxy class, which was the USS uh, Challenger in this uh, in this episode. So we don't have to worry about any new ships to uh, categorize. And we only have one guest star. This is a very self-contained episode. Oh, obviously, excluding LeVar Burton, who we see yeah. at nauseum. Uh, on the um, on the next generation episode, so we aren't aren't going to count him really, um, mm-hmm. but we will obviously kind of make note of him, acknowledge the fact that he was the the director of the episodes, but um, and like I said, his back catalog of uh, of episodes direct is genuinely quite impressive, mm-hmm. um, like it genuinely really is. Um, but for now, the only guest star I can actually tell you will be um, Christine Harnos. Who uh, played um, the role of Tessa Ormond, or Ormond if you prefer, depending on which way you want to pronounce it, uh, all in this episode, Timeless. So she was Chakotay's wife, essentially. Um, the elsewhere roles you'd know her from would be um, she was the ex wife of Dr. Green in the uh, TV series ER, and she was also in other shows like uh, Bloodhounds, uh, Hollywood Confidential, and Remembering Sex. Those were her uh, kind of main roles. But um, again, fun fact: as part of the it's a wrap charity sale, and um, the basically the the, the um, outfit she was wearing from this episode was sold uh, an auction for for charity. So that's basically it. The character doesn't really exist much outside of the of this. She is a one and done in in that sense. Uh, pretty much there to be the the sounding board for Chakotay in this episode, really. Yeah. Dare I say, if I'm am I tend to fade by saying she's a genuine analog, some someone for Chakotay to. To confide in and have a bit of banter with. Maybe yeah, I, su- I, I suppose, but when you really think about it, I don't think she really brought that much to the episode, really. You know, you, you could have had the Doctor being his, his sounding board to when they were uh, talking together on the bridge and the various other interactions. Could have been the Doctor. So, you know, I don't, I don't think she really brought all that much to it, but, you know, fair, you know, fair play to her. She, she got the job and... Mm. That's it. <laughs> yep, pretty much. Yeah, I mean, like, like I said, I don't see added much to the episode, but then again, there's that is it's not a big role. It's, it's very hard to get your, your teeth sunk into something like that when, especially, you are just you know the the, the the character doesn't exist in other timelines. It'd be nice if Chakotay actually met this woman in the real world, but um, we know timeline wise that can't really work out. So we shall work on on that. And um, incidentally. Um, while we are um, b- uh, waiting for a review, I did, for uh, just a uh, curiosity, check to see what episodes LeVar Burton has actually directed in Star mm-hmm. Trek. So, um, I will shout out a couple of names to you, Jerry. So, he has done two um, episodes of The Next Generation, okay? The first ever episode he directed was Second Chances. Does that episode ring a bell? No, go on. If I said it was the one with two Rikers... Oh, that was his first Ooh. one. Yeah, that was the first one he directed. Yeah, so that was his first one, and then the next season after that then was the Pegasus, which Pegasus. is the one that a lot of people attribute to him as kind of his best episode. I will we'll, we'll probably discuss the other ones now in a minute. Mm. He has done two of the Next Generation. He did ten episodes of Deep Space Nine. 
Um, we start off with uh, indiscretion, which is that's the episode where Kira and uh, uh, they find Zial. They find Zial. Yep, that's yeah. that's that one. Um, where uh, Kira and uh, Goldacat are stuck on a on a on a planet, and they find Zial. Then the episode after that, the Sword of Kalis. Um, Ooh, yeah, real some Klingon uh, uh, Klingon fun romp there. Next up then is Bar Association. Which is a Frankie centered episode. These where... are all bangers. Oh, it gets it gets better. Um, after that is Rules of Engagement. Oh, which is, uh, Jesus. Okay. Not, wow, that's a parts. great episode. Yep, I, I personally thought the episode of uh, again, I'm a, I'm a sucker for for courtroom episodes in Star Trek because it's a great trope. It's so niche, but American TV loves courtroom dramas, uh, as a, a few good men proves. But I only know the episode for one thing, and it's like Avery Brooks was saying the word evidence. And that's it. <laughs> Everything else is secondary. I don't give a fuck about the episode otherwise. But Avery Brooks just <laughs> saying that word is magical. I had that as my text message fucking me- uh, ringtone on my current. Oh, just God. every time Jerry Soul sends me a message. Evidence. Oh, there he is. <laughs> um, what else we got? Uh, to the Death is another one. And that is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the rogue Jem Tadar. Um, and uh, uh, the, yeah, the rogue Jem Tadar. And Cisco joining the or uh, what? No, it's not that. Um, bear with. I'm getting my episodes mixed up. Um, to the death. Now is that? Oh, um, it's either it's either the rogue Jem Hadar and then uh, the first uh, utterance, iterant or whatever you want to say of Wayun, or it's to the death. Is is it? Um, uh, Eddington. Is it the Eddington episode? I don't think I don't know. I don't think it's the editing one. No. Oh no, that's for the cause. Is it? That's the cause, cause. Yeah. yeah, yeah no, yeah. to the death is the is the Rogue Gemadar one. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. Now. So okay. Uh, Rogue Gemadar. Another, Gemadar. And, and not a great episode, and but the fact that it, it, it reintroduces us to uh, to um, oh god, what's his uh, Wei Yun? What's his what's his yeah. name? Um, Jeffrey Combs. Jeffrey Combs. Just yeah. oh, so good. Like uh, another one that Lavar Barton did was Things Past. Which is um, this is the one where Cisco, Odo, Dax, and Gara gets trapped back at Tempark Tarek Nor, and only so it turns out it's all it was all Odo's memory, and this is where yeah. they have the they realize it was Odo was the um, was the one to basically kill some in in the Bajorans. Um, yeah. Next up is then Soldiers of the Empire, which is a Klingon centric oh. episode, um, and that that obviously involves uh, Maratok and Worf having a lovely bit of adventure out in the. Um, and the del- in the Gamma Quadrants. Then we have Behind the Lines, which is uh, again another one of the where we're getting really stuck into the Dominion arc here now. And uh, that is the uh, the female change. crash. Yes. Oh no. They, yeah. they no the the Dominion. This is about the the minefields. You know the the minefield around D Space Nine. Yeah. And then the female changeling arrives on um, on D Space Nine to try and. Uh, Attempt Odo to defect. Yeah, but is, is is that not because it's behind the lions? Is that yeah. not when they crash landed on the planet and there was Jem Hadar there? Uh, no, that is that, that is a different. That's uh, shoals and rocks. Oh, behind the lions. Okay. Yeah, this is the, that's actually shoals and rocks. Is an episode before that where they we cut back to Terak Nor as it got renamed to see what's happening there. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I think it's what it was. Yeah. Um. Then we have a resurrection. Um, which is a mirror universe episode of uh, of uh, Vedic Boreal is alive. That's the one. Well, remembers. Well, and not Vedic. He's just Boreal. But Boreal is Boreal. Alive. Yeah. Yeah. And the last episode he did in uh, Deep Space Nine was uh, the Emperor's New Cloak, which is another. Oh, mirror universe very good. Episode. Another mirror universe one. Yeah. And yeah. That's, like it's, it's the funny one. It's a funny one. Yeah. That's where... it, but simply because it's the Ferengi. If it's a Ferengi episode, you know it's funny. Pretty much, yeah. So yeah. it's like the Amir Universe meets the Frankie episode tropes mm-hmm. in uh, DS9. Um, in terms of his credits, he has done eight um, Voyager episodes. First one he did was X uh, Post Facto, which was Tom Paris being committed committed to murder. Um, oh, and and he has to remember. He gets the memories, doesn't it? That's what it is. His memories, yeah. 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 Uh, the image is extracted from the victim's memory. Yeah. So it's kind of the one that Riker had um, the matter of perspective. Mm. Um, next generation, They're just that done in there uh, in Voyager. The one episode then is Dreadnought, um, which was a Cardassian missile that uh, Blana has to reprogram to prevent it um, 
from uh, hitting inhabited worlds. So great episode, great episode, great episodes. And then his next one after that, the Raven. Oh, oh, yeah. Well, I tell you what, he's. He, I didn't realize he had directed so many. Every now and then, you'll see the name come up, directed by Lebar Burton. But yeah. to me now, he's up there with with um, Jonathan Frakes. Mm-hmm. Like, like I, I, I will, I will, I will comfortably say the best director of Star Trek is Jonathan Frakes. I will. Comfortably... I would agree with that. John, Jonathan Frakes gets gets Star Trek. He just gets it. It's kind, of, it's, it's kind of like Terry, Terry Metalis. Yeah. Uh, before he came along, we were getting Star Trek, but it wasn't exactly what we thought it was. Mm, Whereas exactly. there's enough of a, a change in season three of Picard to make it new. But it gives mm. us the, you know, the the nostalgia of the Enterprise D and the Next Generation and whatnot. So he, re- he really got it as well, I have to say. Uh, but but you, also, you, you see, the episode the Lavar is given are episodes that are either kind of deep dives into characters or stuff that you know he can do something with. Yeah. Um, very character centric episodes and very much stuck in the t- in the Star Trek um, uh, sequence, as it were. So like the stuff like in Deep Nine is stuff in the Dominion War, the Mirror Universe. Berengis, whatever it is, stuff that like he knows he can keep be consistent with and make something yeah. some new adventure with. So likewise, Timeless is actually his fourth episode up to this point. Um, then the one after that then is a bit more comical. Um, Live Fast and Prosper. The a con artist impersonating Janeway Tuvok and Chakotay. Scamming people <laughs> out of money. That's another good episode, I have to say. That's, 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 you've, that's you've what not, you, don't, you don't remember. Yeah, but you've, like, yeah. you've not said any bad episodes. There was, there was no. no he's, he's actually yep. really good. <laughs> Next up, then we're going. We're getting into episode, season seven now. So he does Nightingale, um, which is the episode about uh, Harry Kim res- rescuing the alien starship, and the, the one that can cloak. Yeah, uh, and then you have Q two. This is the next episode. That's a fun which, one. That's which a is fun the, one. With John Delancey Jr., as it were. Um, so he's in that one. And then we have his last episode of Voyager is Homestead, which I believe is the episode where Neelix goes home and uh, and leaves the these tips. It was actually the penultimate episode of uh, Voyager, was his last uh, of, of that. It Again, another good episode, but I hated the fucking ending. Yeah. I hate the fact that he had stayed with them for seven years and you're like, Oh well, I'm just gonna fuck off now. Two episodes later, they're gone. Yeah, exactly. It's, which, which, to be honest, at that point, he probably never hears from them again, and he goes, "What happened to them?" Mm. You know, I know, I know the fact that in in the likes of Star Trek Online and 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 whatnot, they they are able to go back to the Delta Quadrant and they meet Neelix again, and it's all very happy, blah blah blah. Yeah, uh, but that's not canon. No, that's not. No, that's yeah. that's not a canon. You know, so it's a. It's it's it was sad. I just I hated Neelix leaving. It really really did. I know it was only two like an episode or two episodes away from the end. Yes. Like, oh, why would you do that, you bastards? Great episode because obviously it, it's a it's a Neelix centric episode. Um, he finally kind of gets that. I suppose he finally gets that kind of happy ending that he always wanted because he'd lost yeah. his family and he'd lost Kess and you know things weren't the same from him. But yeah, uh, the character was drifting significantly. By the end of the sea, by the end of the run. Yeah. So yeah, it just was a nice little. Okay, we finally written off Neelix and gave him the sign. This end of he deserves. But like I said, that's the episode they were probably sitting on until they knew how they had the last season because yeah. that was the. It's the same as anything else. You write the start and the end of your arc, and yeah. everything else exactly. in the middle. I, I, um, at the very least, I'm just glad that he was actually in Endgame, even mm-hmm. if it was just literally a cameo of him playing Cutterscut with with Seven, and that was it. Yeah, you know, so it was. I, 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 I've always wondered: did they, uh, did they record any more of him? Did they do any more with him? Was there any deleted scenes where Seven mm. is like, "We're going home," and and he was like, "Fuck, you're going home now. You're only gone like five days, and now you're going <laughs> back to Earth, you bastards, fucking idiots." Yeah. <laughs> so. But, uh, yeah. But I have to say now, some some serious some serious episodes by Lev Arbor. And would you like to know now how many he does for Enterprise? Go on. He has nine credits to Enterprise. So, Jesus. first one he does is in the first season, and that's Terra Nova, which is Enterprise uh, oh. finding uh, the lost Earth Connolly and they've all kind of gone back into caves and so forth. Um, so that was his first Enterprise credits. Then we had Fortunate Son. Which was the um, the actual the frigate um, fortunate being attacked by Nazcans, 
Oh, um, good one. Yeah, I like that. But as it turns out, the fortunate actually has uh, has some stuff on it that should not be there, and uh, mm-hmm. hilarity ensues. Um, next up then is Cogenitor, which was the which Trip Tucker finding out that there's a third gender. That was an interesting one. Yeah, that was an interesting. It was an interesting one. Yeah, and uh, that's pretty much the, travel, the, the journey of every Florida man at the moment. So uh, yeah, that sounds about right. But um, we have that. So that was his next one. Then one of my personal favorite episodes from Enterprise: First Flight. The um, this is when they tell the story of Archer getting the uh, the involved in the NX test program with the other uh, captain. They bought the yeah. fight in the bar. This is how Trip meets Archer for the first time and Potter's legacy and all that sort of stuff. It's a good uh, it's a good episode, really. Um, what else is then after this? We have then after that Extinction, which is when uh, Archer Reed and Sato are um, infected by a mutagen and that turns mm-hmm. them into more private life forms. And that's back in that's into season three now at this stage. After that, we have a uh, episode called Similitude, um, which is uh, where uh, Tucker is left comatose, and they create a uh, a uh, clone called Sin. Yeah. To to basically make sure to. That's to, a fucking uh, sad one. That is. Yeah, that's that's the two Vix episodes of the of the run, isn't it? Like the the, the moral dilemma. Yeah. Um. Then we're into the last three, and again, these are these are bangers from here on in. Um, the Forgotten, which is when um, the Zindi Council starts thitting and they prevent try and prevent the weapon being launched. Yeah. Um, and uh, they do like a memorial for the uh, for all the kind of shipmates that died over the um, over mm-hmm. the run of the of the war so far. And then we're into the last two, both season fours, and um, one being the Augments, which was obviously the uh-huh. soon. Yeah, um, I knew you were going to say the augments. I knew because let's be honest, there's a reason. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. could he it's, resist? It's, it's his yeah. best. It's his best buddy in the episode. Yeah, exactly. You like, know? As, if, as if it could be anybody else. Um, and then the last one he does is uh, very much at the end of the um, the run, but the actual the arc of the xenophobic humans, which is well, the Terra Prime arc, essentially yeah. demons. Demons was the last episode he does. That was a that's a cracker of an episode. Tremendous as well. episode, absolutely tremendous episode. Um, and like I said, it is it is essentially the uh, the the real season finale for Enterprise. Like, there's no doubt about that. The the Polyga episode does not fucking count. This is the actual season finale for season four. Um, and it, it works so much better that way as well if you treat it like that. But again, you look at the episodes that Levar Burton was uh, was offered and. It, that is the me- mechanism, of course. He doesn't pick them. He's offered these roles, these directorships. And the stuff he's given are just absolutely fucking wonderful. You know, they're really, really good episodes and stuff that he can get really get stuck into. Um, so naturally, we're going to be almost critiquing him in this in this part as well with um, with this episode. But that's like, that's like what, maybe about 30 episodes, 40 episodes of his name? That's a mm-hmm. fucking impressive back catalogue for one director, yeah. you know? So, like I said, Jonathan Frakes might actually have some competition there for... Uh, for best boy when it comes to the director, I, I I still think Frakes is is the best, um, because he gave us probably the best movie, which was First Contact. He, that's why he directed Fair that, much, you yeah. know, and he was fantastic in that. Um, he's directed, he he's directed a lot of the newer stuff as well. So a lot of Discovery, a lot of Picard, uh, he's directed. Um, and if you actually look at the Picard centric episodes that he's done, they're actually better than the other episodes. So yeah, he he yeah, he, 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 he is he. That. He very much is that good, so you know we can't we can't say can't anything there. He he yeah. is the best Star Trek director, Barno. Yeah, I think we can. I think we can accept that. Um, so yeah, let's get on with the scoring of the episode then, Jerry. After that little uh, with tangent. So as we always do, we're going to score these out of ten, and uh, basically the final score we get will decide whether this is a top ranking episode or a little bit of a middling ground. But we start off with uh, the summary of the episode itself, the plot. Mm-hmm. So the plot is. Harry Kim and Chakotay from the future uh, find uh, Voyager buried under a shitload of ice after a uh, basically a experimental warp drive fails on them and kills the entire crew except for those two and they go back in time to try and well they don't they don't go back in time but they try and uh, stop it from happening by sending messages to, to the past and we essentially get the story happening in parallel for the majority of the episode and um, Considering that this is the 100th episode of Voyager and they did do something a little bit different, 
I'm relieved they didn't do another fucking Mirror Universe type because we were bombarded with them in DS9 and half of them weren't that good, let's be honest. Yeah. Um, they didn't really indulge in the Mirror Universe until Enterprise, but at least that was kind of a, a good excuse to get everyone in the fucking TOS uniforms and onto the uh, old um, bridges and all that sort of stuff. So that was a nice reason. I like the idea of it as a plot. I think it's a good plot. Yeah. Um, and it's as I said, it is their take on yesterday's Enterprise. So when the score is relatively high, it's not the best one of um, of Voyager, though, because it's one of those ones that's a victim of where it is in the series. It you know it's a kind of a throwaway episode, but it's a fun it's a fun one to begin with. So I'm kind of inclined to give it an eight. What would you think, Jerry? The the way I see it is, I I think the best plots are the simplest ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, the ones that try to be clever and overcomplicated. Uh, piss me off, and it's okay. like it, it, it's it's too much. This was a, a nice, easy plot to uh, follow. Uh, a, B, C, uh, start to finish. It was it was great. Um, you knew exactly what what was going on. So basically, Voyager had crashed. Something had happened. Uh, we then find out uh, it was Kim that sent the wrong uh, temporal coordinates or wrong. Uh, Yep. whatever it was the, the, the corrections course corrections and they crashed and they all died and he's trying to fix that uh it it's a simple plot uh, but I think I, I I just feel this the this the simple plots are the best ones because mm-hmm. it's not trying to be clever it's not trying to have little things thrown here there and everywhere it's just we go from a to B to C there's your conclusion done and yeah. it, it, it it was it was it was a good episode it was as i said to you it's the best i feel uh, harry kim episode in mm. all of seven seasons of, of voyager um it, it's interesting the fact that we got the challenger which is a galaxy class ship and of yeah. course why wouldn't geordie have a galaxy class ship because yeah. he was the one it you know people go on about oh uh, o'brien was the one who kind of perfected the defiant well if he perfected the defiant then geordie perfected the galaxy he absolutely yeah, did right. yeah, that you was know, his baby yeah. that was it that was his baby so uh, he would absolutely want to have his own galaxy class obviously with the more modern upgrades and stuff like that of course, that's the way it is. We got LeVar Burton. We got Jordy in, in this episode. Uh, we got a, a future-looking uh, uh, Ensign Kim, or whatever he was at the time, or, or uh, Criminal Kim. We call him Criminal Kim. Kim. Renegade Kim. Renegade <laughs> Kim. That's the one. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll, an all-round good episode, a great plot. Uh, so I'd be inclined to go with you. We'll go eight. Okay, we'll go eight with that then. Good. Um, so yeah, with eight then to start us off, we move on then to the setting. So again, we're talking about the the kind of atmosphere of the episode, the um, what kind of the extra things it does to throw in uh, to to make all the scenes feel unique. So obviously, the Giddens has a bit of leeway with the settings in this one because they have a lot of different ch- like scene changes uh, on the, all these things. So you've got like I'm trying to think now to the top of my head. You've got obviously the snow capped um, Voyager and how that that looks naturally quite different with the lighting and so forth then you got like you basically smash cut to like party time and engineering where I got confetti and champagne and all this sort of stuff so very different feels of the episode then what I would say to that at the same time is that I use yesterday's enterprise as a comparison and what that episode does really well is that it tells you it's an alternate timeline by having all of it look completely different whereas between the past and the f- and the future, when they're going back and forth, the lighting is the same, and the only real difference is the fact that like Chakotay and 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 Kim look older, but the actual aesthetics don't look any different, especially uh, on the Delta Fair. I know it's like out of mothballs essentially; they was basically stolen it, but you do something visual to try and like kind of uh, convey that it's a a different timeline. Um, but uh, I suppose I don't know if that's a, it was intentional or not. I feel like it just was something that was kind of missed. Personally, um, I love your thoughts on that, Jerry. Actually, what do you what do you think? I, second one is? I think it was their their way of saving money. Uh, Probably, it, yeah. It was an episode they could do very cheaply because they had everything to hand. They didn't need to make anything new except for a Borg, a bit of a Borg skull and a Borg temporal node. That's all they needed, and that was minor stuff, absolutely minor. Yeah. Nothing, nothing else needed to be changed apart from their hair. 
a little bit of grey in Chicote and a wig on Harry Kim. That's and a few leather jackets. That was it. Everything mm. else they had to hand. I did like the fact that you know uh, the um, crashed and frozen Voyager looked spectacular. Uh, yes. Inside, you know, it's it's obviously it's just them uh, fr- like freezing. Uh, the bridge and the various other or other parts, but I think it looked fantastic. I also think uh, in the flashback of the new slipstream drive, the slipstream drive itself looked fantastic. It was a great, yeah. you know, it, it did change the setting of their of uh, the engine room. It looked it looked good. It was a new feel to it, and um, mm. whatnot. But as I said to you, I am. Um, it, it, this was definitely an episode of them wanting to save money because all you got of LeVar, LeVar Burton was him sitting there in his uh, nem- his uh, first contact uniform mm. but to me it, all you have to do is look at it and you think he's, he, it looks like he's sitting in Captain Janeway's uh, ready room in the ready or, room yeah or, exactly. or in or in the uh, the conference room it just mm. that looks like where, where he's sitting it doesn't look like a bridge there's a window behind them for God's sake you know yeah. what, what what bridge is going to have a window right behind where the captain is it's, it, it's not um, no. so I felt uh, you know they, they, they did obviously want to, to save money in it so uh, I'm going to go six yeah, I think um, I think that's a fair score considering that like there are are very obvious things they could have done but didn't. And as I said, whether that's a money saving exercise or just they didn't think of it, I suppose you could you could argue with one or the other. Um, so yeah, six I think is a fair shout. Next up then is uh, writing. So uh, again, writing is a is a curious one for this one. I do have a lot of negatives in this one mainly because some of the lines are very cheesy. I think they're deliberately cheesy as well because it's trying to like set out that like they're gone all um, anti-hero on us and like okay they, they kind of lost me in the first bit and then he kind of kept, kept me coming back then when they actually do let the boys act and like show off the emotional turmoil and the and they, they write the dialogue to, to suit the one thing I would say as well is that they did waste a lot of movement in the middle of the episode by trying to make this Chakotay and the, and, te, and, the, and Tessa connection work but like I said she is a throwaway character and there's only so much you can do without being kind of blunt about it and saying, "Look, this character is not is not going to be doing much, unfortunately." Um. So, what? How much do you want to donate to the episode? For the scenes that she was in, it gets a point across that Jacoby has lived a different life since Voyager, and is 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 on the up is is on the cusp of basically making a family and settling down and all this sort of stuff. But it's trying to make the point that. He is not settled because of what happened to to Voyager all those all those years ago. Now, again, I I would have criticisms over the way Bell trying to act at the scene because he's still very um, static. Um, I know that's kind of which Dakota character is, but he he's too stoic. He needs to show something. He needs to snap. He needs to show some sort of emotion rather than just be numb. Because at least that way, if he did that. You can actually say, okay, Chakotay has actually been impacted by this, as opposed to just feeling like the same Chicote. Yeah. That'll come up in the next category. But writing wise, I think they 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 needed to ditch that bit very, very quickly, because that is kind of irrelevant to the plot. I will say the exchange between Jordy and um and Chicote, very well written, very well done. Um, and then the dynamic between the Doctor and Harry Kim, also very well done. The whole second half of the episode was excellent to me. Mm-hmm. I thought it really picked up steam very, very quickly. So uh, with the negatives aside, I would probably give it a seven altogether. Um, as as you say, there's there's a lot of silly throwaway cheesy lines in it. Mm. It very much was put in there on purpose because yeah. it's just it's what they were what they were aiming for, but it didn't really hit the mark, unfortunately. Um, the you know I, I should say the second half as well was 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 much better. The interaction between Chakotay and and, uh, and Jordy fantastic um i think the you know the the, the pieces of of uh, dialogue between um the doctor and, and harry kim especially up to the point where harry thinks oh that's it we i can't do it i you know i have only four minutes i can't do it we're, we we've killed them we're, we're we're dead we've killed i've killed them you know blah 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 uh very very well written um you know i i think robert Ricardo is one of the one of the finest actors in in star trek yeah. Um, the fact that he he can play any character and be the same character at the same time. 
if yeah, you're, if you're in emotional, Armenia. The emotional yeah. range he has is astounding. He, he, yeah. Exactly. And he, he really, really is fantastic. He's one of those actors that I would love to see even make a brief cameo in uh, a legacy show or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so I thought, I thought, you know, the first half, okay. Second half, definitely picked up. Um, what did you go? Seven? Seven, yeah. I, I, I'd go six. So do you want to meet in the middle and go six and a half? You go six and a half then, yeah. Fair point. Yeah. Uh, Grant, uh, then we've got the acting, which, uh, Jerry, is your wheelhouse. So um, what did you think of the acting in this episode? When you... When you first look at it, um, and especially when you you first see, uh, it's not even Chakotay for me. Chakotay is just Chakotay. You know, he doesn't change in this episode to any other episode he's been in. He's the same Chakotay. So I don't think there was anything spectacular from him in this. Uh, He's a bit of a strange character to watch because you want him to say or do something. You know, you, you want him to, to be more, about, more, a bit more yeah. emotion. He's he's very Vulcan esque in in his yeah. uh, delivery of the character. Uh, is Robert Beltran. Um You know, I I wouldn't even. Uh, what was it? Tess was it? Was that her name or what was her name? Tessa. 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 Again, again, very. She's perfect for him because she's just like him. She's very two dimensional. It's just like. Eh. Uh, Levar, you, you you couldn't really say much uh, about uh, Levar Burton in it because he didn't have m- much to do, but he was very he was very Jordy, very yeah. much Jordy in it. Uh, but the the acting has to go to to uh, Tahiri Kim and and the Doctor uh, for that for that scene where um, basically uh, the, Harry Kim has you know he's he realised shit I can't save them uh, we're dead I was the one that killed them. And it's the interaction between him and the doctor, which is just fantastic. Um, is, is it enough to save this category uh, from from getting a lower score than normal? Probably not. Um, it, the interaction between them is, is great. Their acting is fantastic. Uh, to me, though, a lot of people will. It's it's obviously a Harry Kim centric Harry Kim centric episode. Yeah. But I think the the acting chops go to the doctor in this because he was fantastic. Just for that scene, um, yeah. really, really good. Uh, I'm gonna go seven. Yeah, I actually would have said seven yeah. myself. To be okay. honest, yeah, but good. I think seven is a fair one. Um, next then is the action, and I would say probably the strength of this episode overall. It's a very dynamic episode. As I said, it kind of loses. It slows down a little bit in the middle. Again, talking about Chicote and Tessa and kind of getting that proverbial sea story done um, mm-hmm. about what's been happening there. Um, but once it gets back on track and it's doing the the two timelines in parallel, it's a tremendous watch. It's a great watch. It's like, it basically like the, the first half of the episode is a calm before the storm. Mm-hmm. And you're setting everything up. You're kind of trying to, it's a pick up the pieces first off. You're trying to see what's happened to Voyager, what's happened to everybody else. You get your background, you get your outline. Come back to the real world and see what's happening and then we start kicking into gear from say act two onwards and i think from act two onwards to the end is an excellent it's a fucking thrill ride it's roller coaster dynamic you don't even notice the time passing when we're watching it here because we're literally just like seated the pants and flying through the episodes and um, so i think it's one of the strengths is the fact that like again there's no fight scenes doesn't need to be it's just got the great energy going through it and that's what we're kind of judging on this episode so Casting the first like 10 15 minutes aside where it's all a lot more reflective and uh and pensive i'm probably going to give this an eight or a nine um just for the second half alone but again jerry I- i'd like to hear what you think about it oh no um what'd you say eight or a nine yeah I, you know, I would agree with you there. I thought it was, I thought it was good. You know, you know me when it comes to this stuff. Um, yeah. You know, if 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 it really hits, then you're like, ah, mm. yeah. Like, there's been some really good episodes, but mm. yeah, I know. I um, I don't really have much to say about it to be honest. I yeah, I'd go, yeah, I'd go an eight. Yeah. I'll go, I'll go, well, I'll, I'll go an eight. And, you know, there was some good yeah. bits, but I want you, I I'll go an eight. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a fair score. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think so because, like I said, it's 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 the it's account the fact that it was a slow it was a deliberately slow start. So I think that's 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 understandable, isn't it? It, it picks mm. up it picks up steam towards the end and then has a nice little reflective se- uh, moment at the end. So I think that's checked out. Um, yeah, there, was, there, was, there, was, there was good moments. There was good moments in it, you yeah. know. The, the, and there's unique. I should say unique moments. It's not mm. just your typical Voyager episode. There is unique moments in it. Um, 
but you know you've got that bit you know but at the start it, like as I say the very pensive ending you're like do do like slow and it's it's good but um there has been better so yeah yeah we'll we'll go with that that's fair um next then is the effects category and again we're talking anything visually they've done little tricks and uh whatever other kind of um uh, visual visual and audio stuff they've done to to make the episode work so again obviously the key one i'd say is actually i love personally the actual visual of the voyager buried under the ice as an actual as a proverbial thumbnail for the episode it is excellent to catch your attention it's like oh fuck what's happened and yeah. you go to the opening titles from there and i'm always going to give you a plus to the opening titles by the way because they are just tremendous opening titles but um but just the, that initial hook it's an excellent it's one of the best visual hooks i've seen uh, in this series so far because you're literally watching the episode and going what the fuck is the ship doing there like what what it's not meant to be there and then that they launches into the episode from there then we have the kind of the the, the blizzard and um, the the frosted over um voyager with everyone kind of smothered under the snow they all look really well done i don't know like which way to do it did they do it like body cast or do they have it that you just everyone play dead in the fucking powder snow i don't know but they they, they made it work either way um I, I like i said a few of the cheap stuff starts kicking into gear then like like i said the tricorders look the same after 15 years when you know when we know even from nemesis that the tricorders start looking changing different uh changing it differently yeah. Uh, a lot of it is very much uh, de- uh, done on the budget, in a sense. They didn't want to make new props or whatever it is. Um, there were small little nice, t- nice touches. Like I said, the, the future badges were there right from the outset. So you know, just from the first scene, that's a future badge and that's in the past. So you the, the visual language is there. There's just not enough of it for me. Um, there's a few nice little touches across the, across the, um, the episode. But at the same time, if you wanted to get across that this is 15 years in the future, it doesn't visually look like it. No. The Delta Flyer hasn't changed. I, again, obviously it's a mothballs, but there's retrofits. There's like out gears, you get, like outfits you can do. I do think Harry Kim looks good. Like future Harry Kim looks good. I think Chakotay looks okay. Um, because they haven't done what they normally do and just like put the age makeup on them. They've done more subtle things with it. And I think that's better. 15 years is a good point of reference sometimes. Like people, especially with Harry, like he's going to grow into his face. He's going to grow hair. He's going to have a beard or some shit like that. At least he looks a bit reasonable rather than having fucking melty face fucking Captain Pulaski or Dr. Pulaski in the next generation. So there's a there's a difference in doing that. Um, and... Yeah, I think that's that's essentially. And you mentioned actually the slipstream drive as well. The actual um, the visual of that is really nice, and uh, and simple as well. Uh, so yeah, I think not an astounding episode, but a completely done episode is what I'd say. Um, so probably a six or seven for me. What would you think, Jerry? Uh, I, I'll go with seven with you. I think the, the slipstream looked great. As you said, the visual right at the very beginning of the Frozen Voyager was fantastic because you really hadn't a clue. You're like, what yeah. the fuck is going on here? What has happened? Uh, you've you've got the, um, uh, then then of course you, they go inside the ship, and that I think is just fantastic. I think it looks amazing. Uh, but again, they just didn't do enough with the likes of Jacoby and and with Harry Kim, and especially the um, the Delta Flyer. You would mm-hmm. I, I would if it had looked a bit shabby or looked at, like hadn't been used. Rusted, yeah, uh, yeah, in, in a long time. Then you say, okay, fair enough. Um, or giving them different, you know, just a leather jacket just wasn't enough for me. Um, even even an update for me, if they had had an updated uh, tricorder, yeah. that would have been That's enough for bad. me. I think it would have been enough. So I'm gonna go. You went six to seven. I'm gonna go with six. So we'll meet in the middle again. So six and a half. Six and a half for effects. Okay, Grant. So, with that then, we move on then to, uh, I think, your favourite category after all this, which is the score. Um, I have a lot of positives for this episode, really, considering, again, they didn't, they, they kind of borrowed a lot from the Voyager suite, but I think the actual first few minutes of the episode, they really emphasised the music in this. I think they maximised the, the music quite well, Jerry, but again, I, I value what you think here. So, it, 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 this is one of my favourite categories, when, whenever yeah. we're doing something. So, whenever, uh, to me, one of the best... Uh, scores um, in in the episodes we've done so far has to be the visitor. Yeah. It's just as soon as it starts, you're like, oh, you're just you're sucked in, and you're like, Jesus Christ, this is good. Um, there were elements of 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 this in in uh, this episode because it wasn't your as I say, it wasn't your typical 
uh, Voyager music. It wasn't yeah. like, you know, it's not like the original series where 90% of it was all the same music just put in different places. Uh, mm -hmm. There was very much new music in here. Um, there was that lovely, uh, it was a very sad bit when Chakotay goes to the bridge and he finds the likes mm -hmm. of uh, seven, um, he finds Janeway, uh, Janeway and, and Seven and, and uh, Paris. Mm -hmm. And it is, it just draws you in. You're like, oh, Jesus. And there's like little notes to the Voyager theme in there. You can hear a few little progressions there, but it's not the full thing. Like I say, it exactly. feels kind of like the kind yeah. of half remembered or something. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, there are parts of the episode where it's very much back to uh, back to normal. It is um, the typical uh, Voyager suite. Yeah. Uh, and then especially like the action suite I would call it as well as when, when they're being chased by the challenger um, but then again you go back again to, to Kim being in the mess hall and Jamie comes in and it just kind of gets quieter and it's 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 nicer and it mm. just kind of gives you it, it kind of gives you very much the not a happy ending but um, at least you didn't die ending yeah. type, type of thing uh, so for me um it was, you know, it, it, I, I kind of look at about 70, 30 in terms of new, unique music for this episode. So I'm going to go a bit an eight on this because you know me. I love yeah. the score episode. I love the score category, I should say. It mm. is particularly uh, it is particularly good. Uh, if it's a basic one, then it's just basic. But this was anything but basic. This was good. This was particularly good for, for, uh, uh, for this episode. Yeah, so I'll go an eight. Yeah, because I think we've, we've, we've always tried and judge it depending on the effectiveness of how it's used as well. Because, as I said, it's like, if you're comparing, like, say, a good example is, like, season one of TNG, where they have, like, a lot of bespoke music for each episode. But that's, like, it's, 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 it, that's a bit of an indulgence in considering what the rest of the, do with, what the, rest of the seasons end up doing. They don't say cut corners, but they get smarter with what they do. So if you compare one episode we haven't done yet in the season, for example, is The Inner Light. And that has a completely different fucking soundtrack to The Next Generation generally. But that's because it's another world. It's a different time. It's all these different things. It's yeah. audibly yeah. getting across that this is new and this is different. In the same way that in The Enterprise, they bring back a lot of those music suites. And in Star Trek Picard, they start bringing back music suites because they have the money to do so. But... Oh. Um, but so, I, I tell you what, when we go to, when we go to review Picard... Yeah, and if we if we review more than one episode of of the third season, mm. I'm just telling you now. No matter what episode it is, it's a ten for score. It's, it's gonna be a ten for score. Yeah, no, it's I, a I, 10. I think we're all agreed on that. Yeah, but like it's and but that's a, there's a good reason for it. They they the people on the like on the production know the significance and the importance of putting good music together. Yeah. And again, for this, this is a kind of a weird middle ground where like you can't spend stupid amounts of money every episode on a orchestral backdrop you have to make use of what you have from your art library but then if you want a particular piece to get across your point that's when you start when you have something to compose for yourself and that's what i think this episode has done like i said not like spectacular throughout but just picks its battles very well and we're happy to award points on that because i think we should um next up then is scene so this one is a, a relatively mixed bag for me because there's certain scenes i absolutely absolutely really fucking loved in this uh, and then there's a few that are kind of wasted wa wasted energy. As I said, the Tessa and Chakotay scenes were always going to stay and figure out as just, this is redundant. Stick to Harry Kim. Uh, personally, from my from my uh, belief, it would be better if it was just Harry Kim that was trying to save Voyager, not just Chakotay. Like, he needed, a, a, Harry kind of needed a second person there, in a sense. Um, because I don't think the, the plot would have, would have held on Harry Kim that long. It had to be like an older more established Harry Kim um, whereas like he's 25 years and he's a captain of the ship then you can have an ensemble cast to suit whereas like why are we doing this captain it's like shut up and do what you're fucking told type of thing I, that's what I would prefer that way so having Jacoti wedged in is almost like you, you have to give this guy something to do because we have nothing else from written in the, in, the, in the season and that kind of shows in the scenes but the yeah. stuff with Harry himself is superb and um, mm -hmm. I don't know if my favorite scene actually does involve Chakotay, and that's the exchange with with Jordy. Just fantastically done, and um, just the way it's written, the way it's per, per, uh, performed by both uh, Beltran and and, uh, and Burton, where there is a very begrudging respect to what they're doing. I just thought it was a, it was a very starfly way of doing things, yeah. very starfly ways of expecting. Like uh, like 
this is a this is a cautionary tale to 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 the to new Trek producers in a sense. We're like, this is actually how people in the 20th century resolve an ideological argument. They respectfully disagree, then they start sparring. Not like in some other episodes where it's like, well, fuck you, you're wrong, shoot the gun, and that's it. That that's not how humans in this time will are going to behave. They're going to be a little a little bit more pleasant about it because you know they're evolved beings, and that's what you do. Um. So yeah, I think. Uh, with a few negatives being the kind of wasted scenes but the scenes that do land are very very good so 7 to an 8 for me what do you think Um, I I will go by you know I like the scene between um, um, Chakotay and and Geordi because it has Geordi and he he is that good Mm. Um, but for me it's 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 I've I've said it already it's the scene between uh, the doctor and, and, and Harry Um where Harry believes that they failed they you know yeah. he's the one that killed them he can't help them they're all about to die and it's like put, pull yourself together man type of thing yeah and to me that's that's the scene and that is the scene in in this uh very very good the two of them uh, work very well together um mm-hmm. and but the thing is it's in this scene where you see the gruff angry um, uh, future Kim turn into young Harry again. Yeah, the insecurity. Because he, he, yeah. he goes into he's he's not talking like this anymore. <laughs> I did not kill the one that killed him. So he kind of mm. goes like he go he goes from basically being a man to a child again. Um, yeah. So I think that absolutely. Obviously, we have two very different uh, scenes that are our favorite. But uh, yeah, I'll go seven to eight as well. So probably what we meet in the middle, seven and a half. Seven and a half, yeah, absolutely. Um, and then much on that point, then we talk about characters. And again, this is actually a quite a positive car- a category for me as well because everything kind of feels right about the characters in this. Um, yeah. Again, well, apart, apart from Tessa, <laughs> at, apart from Tessa, yeah, I, I do have to give it a, a markdown because she's just a throwaway character. If she was on Voyager, if she was a crewman, if she was on Starfleet, I would have been okay with it. If it was a legacy character, if it was somebody like fucking that was on the Enterprise or Deep Space Nine, then I should go, oh yeah, I remember her. You know, they these two hook up and they might have an axe to grind against fucking uh, Starfleet. She's become an ex Maquis and all this sort of stuff, but just just nothing there. You just you didn't yeah. give us anything. Um, but then with Harry, well, they, well, first of all, I gave two very big points for for Jordi LaForge absolutely having a, spe- a, a, a galaxy class as his own ship. That is absolutely on brand for, for Jordi. That is 100% consistent. And it does help when the director is doing the episode because he knows what his character would want, you know. Um, but that's at least consistent, you know. Um, I think there's a lot of good character points for Harry. Again, it's hard to do character development for a future person, as in... You're basically looking at like 15 years down the line, what's he going to be like? And doing the character development that way, in a sense, where this is what he's willing to do to make things right. And curious enough, in a couple of seasons' time, his captain does the exact same thing. So you can tell it's it's the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, in a sense. Um again, I think there's there's a good few character moments, as I said, the doctor kind of almost changing a uh, mid-scene as it were to uh to being like the bewildered man at the time to go and no no focus on what you're doing let's try and save everybody now that i'm now that he's on board and just say yes let's definitely do this yeah. um, and again small thing as well uh just seven nine being drunk just very small thing i don't i don't think i'll award a point for it. i just found it very funny yeah just a little just a little thing for jerry ryan to have you know while she's uh while she's being ogled at by fucking tv executives but um but yeah, that was um, just uh, I got it's a strong category for me again, so I'm kind of willing to go eight on this one myself, possibly nine. I I can't add anything to what you said there. Um, you kind of spot on with, with, with what you said. Uh, I love the fact that you you threw in a bit of seven being drunk there. That was that was good. Yeah. Uh, what do you say, seven to an eight? Yeah, but, uh, but I'm, I'm more swayed towards eight than seven. I'll go an eight with you. Yeah, I'll go an eight with you because I thought that you know they they. Seven stuff was good. Jordy stuff was good. The Doctor, as I said, the yeah. Doctor. It this it might be a Harry Kimmel episode. It was all about the Doctor for me. He was fantastic. Um, yeah. Give me a show just about the Doctor. I'd happily watch it. Okay, excellent. Um, then we end up with the consequences. And um, so this is again one of those episodes where like, the, the history has been changed, the timeline's been fixed or fucked up, depending on your point of view. Hmm. And it's hard to kind of like I suppose. Ca- like 
assess how much the show changes from that and of course and how the characters change from that so um i suppose from my point of view and again obviously jerry you might have your own takeaways from this episode as well the biggest one is the fact that they do shed 10 years off the trip to delta mm-hmm. quadrant so in a sense like because it's the 100 episodes they're in the season five they know at this stage the star trek run is that it's seven seasons and you're normally done so they know at some stage you have to cut the distance between where you were in the Delta Quadrant. So this is a 10-year jump. Perfect. That's grand. It's a neat means to an end. It's an episode. It's a, it's your reward for the episodes. So that's the, the consequence, significance of that, I guess. And mm-hmm. um, naturally, everyone didn't die. So that's good. That's a consequence in its own right. And um, I suppose the big question, and I'll probably turn this to you, Jerry, to see what you think. Does this actually change the Harry Kim character at all in the show? Or does he kind of stay the same? You would, okay. like to, you, you would like to you would like to think you would like to think yeah. that it changed him for the better but it didn't change him one bit he was still exactly the same Harry Kim after this the one who was willing to take risks the one who wanted to get home earlier uh, so no it really did change him so in terms of consequence for Harry Kim no he was exactly the same he was the same annoying little bollocks you know, but we need to get home or the very gullible one there's a wormhole what and fucking mm. Egypt like so uh, unfortunately it didn't change him at all uh, but I do agree. Consequences, yes, they, they got an additional 10,000 light years. So I think by this point, you were around about, I think it was 45,000 yeah. light years away. So, you know, 10 years is generally 10,000 light years off your journey. They'd, they'd been thrown, um, you know, various different points. Up to this point, they had gone um, a few thousand uh, light years themselves. Mm. Then uh, Kess threw them uh, past Borg space, which was 10,000 light years. Then this was 10,000 light years. The various other things. So I think it's around about 45,000 light years they've left to go. So obviously the consequences of that. But I think there's something that you're uh, leaving out. And mm. it's obviously not on purpose. But um, without this episode, I, I believe without this episode, you don't get Prodigy. Good point, actually. Yes. Very good point. I because didn't even you've got the quant- yeah, you've yeah. got the quantum slipstream drive. Um, obviously, they had used the quantum slipstream before when they were um, Arturo had, had thought, "Oh, we'll, we'll give you this. Sh- oh, we, we've just found you a ship, a Starfleet ship." It was only a couple of episodes episodes before this, um, and it's uh, that's where they come uh, across the quantum slipstream drive. Yeah. Um, and again, actually, that was another thing where they went a few more thousand light years. So it's around about yeah, thirty-five to forty-five thousand light years left to go. They've already travelled some 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 distance. Mm. Um, but without without that episode and without this one, you don't get the entirety of the, of the Prodigy show because that's what it was about. It was about the the ship, and it was about what the ship represented, and it was the quantum slipstream drive. Yeah. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's the consequences for me. Obviously. It had amped up. They they had travelled further than they had for quite some time. They were getting closer. It was around about this time that they started getting, you know, the likes of Barkley is like, right, we. Need I was going to say they're the kind of communication need, range, aren't they? Yeah, yeah we, so. we we need to get a hold of them. Let let's let's yeah. use the pulsar and we let's use a micro wormhole. Blah blah blah. Mm. So it's around about this time they start communicating with with Starfleet, which is fun, which is. I think brilliant in the show. I think it's great. Yeah, it's, um, it's a great addition to the to it because it just means you can do stuff out yeah. off Voyager for a while, and it's great. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, so it, I did have some uh, some bigger consequences. It was the fact that they did get closer to home, which was great. Didn't change Harry one bit, but you know he's still a yeah. dick. Uh, That's weird enough. It, like all the consequences relate to the show as opposed to Harry himself, which is weird yeah. considering he this is kind of a character episode for him. Yeah, you so, would think his arc would change, but no, he didn't change in any way. Yeah. Like you've got if you if if you look at data and mm. various data centric episodes, um, he was still essentially data afterwards, but there was always a little change in him after he had a data centric episode. Yeah, it was, it was a less with, with, ex- is, yeah. exactly yes. Whereas with Kim, he was just there was a reason he was an ensign because he was a prick. Um, that's it. <laughs> but yeah. for con- consequences were, I think, high enough to to warrant a higher score in this. So I'll go with seven to an eight. Let's, let's leave it at 7.5 then in that case. Yeah, cool. Well then, okay, so. So, Jerry, I hear you asking, where does it leave um, our um, our uh, new addition to this um, to this, uh, to this uh, uh, series? Well, uh, you'd be uh, happy to know it, it doesn't involve the top 10. <laughs> I, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, does it surprise you to know that I kind of knew that? 
<laughs> yeah, I, I think you can. You, I think your your maths uh, it doesn't let you down there in a sense. But as I said, we'll, we'll go through the scoreline and see where we lead us from there. So, bottom of the list is unfortunately Voyager again with the Voyager conspiracy on fifty nine. The Arsenal Freedom, point half a point ahead of that in the uh, 20, uh, 25th position as it is now, uh, around the 27th. Enterprise Incident from the original series is third last in our series at 67. Then we have Dear Doctor, our first entry from uh, Enterprise on this at 71.5. We have another Voyager entry in Tinker Tenor Doctor Spy, which is 72, joined by the hip by the original series uh, episode The Doomsday Machine at 72 and then we have our first ever three-way tie in this table as the next generation uh, duo of Conspiracy and The Battle on 73 are now joined by Timeless which is ranking at 73 out of 100 40 episodes within it that's not a bad score in fairness yeah um, I think so yeah I think it's fair it's a fair uh, a fair yeah. ranking I think it, you know, it, this was never going to get it up into the top tens or the top fives, whatever it was, yeah. because the caliber of those episodes are just stellar. So it was never going to be, it was never going to even get close. Well, I think it's a, it's a fair uh, score. Seventy three is a fair score. Mm. Uh, I don't think I, I don't think I could have gotten it any higher than that. So yeah, I think it's a fair score. I think we'd be, I think we would just been too nice then if you were, but. Um... But yeah, and then further on then, for those uh, unsure of how we are ranking up outside of it, we start off then on 17th, which is Tapestry from The Next Generation at 76, followed then by Spacey, the point ahead from the original series. Trials and Tribulations from Deep Space Nine is at 79 out of 100. Then we're reaching into the 80s, which is uh, Q-Who from uh, Next Generation, followed by Q-Pid, Robin Hood episode, which is a point ahead. Then we have the original series double of The Balance of Terror and The Trouble with Tribbles, both at any 1.5. Then we're reaching the top 10. In 10th place is Family from Next Generation at 82 out of 100. We then get The Skin of Evil, one point ahead of that from also Next Generation on 83. Joint with the Andorian Incident from Enterprise at the same score. Lower Decks, currently 7th, or rather 6th I should say, um, which is at 83.5. Top 5 at the moment is The Visitor from Deuce Ace 9 at 83.4. Emissary, the two-parter uh, debut of Deep Space 9 at 84. Third place is a mock time from the original series at 88 out of 100. The best of all worlds is currently second, still at 90.5. And in the pale moonlight, still imperious, number one from Deep Space Nine at 91 out of 100. So, uh, Jerry, it's um, still very much untested uh, at the top of the table, but uh, we kind of knew that going in, really, wasn't it? But Thomas uh, was. We, we knew, go upset, yeah. Really. We we knew going into this episode it wasn't going to be touching the the the, the number one, mm. but and and this is a big but. I feel now from this point, um, the episodes are going to get, you know, progressively better. Mm -hmm. Um, we are going to have some challenges for, uh, the number one spot. I believe. We do. Uh, you you have your thoughts, I have mine. For me, there is a handful of episodes that could potentially challenge for number one spot. Yeah, uh, and in my mind, those episodes are primarily Deep Space Nine episodes. So it would be Deep Space Nine, Detroni, Deep Space Nine. Uh, there is a one or two, uh, maybe in the next generation. Um, if if I don't you see, this is the thing. I don't know whether we should include card stuff in this review because if we did I know f there was one or two episodes of card season 3 that would absolutely beat the top spot right now uh, yeah. but and I don't see bias talking as yeah. well so we do have to let the we do have to let the the, the, the pie cool a little, bit, a little bit there so yeah we probably wouldn't be touching Picard uh, at least season 3 anyway for uh, some time to let us let the fanboy in us kind of calm down a little bit and uh, revel in what yeah. we've had you know but yeah. Uh, yeah that's a fair point but what we'll do, we'll do is to, to whet the appetite because again if you catch your mind back to the start of this uh, year as it were when we started this we set out what our next 10 episodes were going to be so we'll give you a bit of a refresher here because I'm sure Jerry remembers all the next episodes don't you Jerry you remember what oh going? yeah yeah but I you know I'm, I don't have your eloquence so you go ahead of course yes so so yes, as uh, as I said at the start, top of the episode, this is the start of our time arc. These are time-oriented episodes, um, very much based on um, anything unfucking or fucking timeline. 
Um, but also to, they are kind of top tier episodes as well. So we're doing what we do normally and we're not kind of favouring one series anyway because let's be fair, if we did just time episodes, there's a lot in the next generation. Like there's got the one with two Picards, you've got the two Rikers, you've got Cause and Effect, which is a tremendous episode. We'd be stuck in the next generation again, essentially. Likewise, there's a lot in um, New Trek as well. They love fucking with time. And like practically all of the season two of Picard is just messing with the timeline. Um, and, and all that stuff and then a lot of other episode, uh, shows don't really get a bit of a, twi- uh, a share in it so we're being fair and we're doing one per um, show again like we like we have done the last while mm-hmm. so episode 26 our next episode the first dip into going backwards or forwards in time is one where we go back in time um, most of these actually are where we go back in time if I'm not mistaken um, so we start off with Deep Space Nine for this one you re- recall there that the um, the visitor was one of the few episodes you reckoned that the uh, that we didn't uh, we only really kind of mess with the timeline there. Would that be a fair thing to say? Um, it, it, it's, it's not 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 necessarily not necessarily that it messed with the timeline. There were there were various episodes of Deep Space Nine where it messed with the timeline, but they always seem to go backwards in time rather than forwards. Uh, to my knowledge, the only forwards in time episode for Deep Space Nine was the visitor. Um, because you've got Captain Nog, you've got he's Captain of Defiant, mm. you know the uh, the Klingons are in control of Deep Space Nine, uh, yeah. yada yada yada. Whereas every I believe every other episode is all backwards in time. Um, and you'll be correct, yeah. Mm-hmm. So so with that, then we are going to be picking one of those episodes where they do go back in time, um, and this one is actually going all the way back to uh, the 1940s. In fact, we are going to be picking Little Green Men. So one, so this is actually our first proper Ferengi centric episode on the series as well. I'm going to see how it uh, how it um, stands up amongst the uh, the Titans that we have on at the moment. So Little, Little Green Men will be our next episode and will be D Phase Nine's entry into this time arc of ours. But Jerry, it does get very very serious from here. We have the big go- the big guns are out here. So episode twenty seven is actually going to be our next foray into New Trek. It will actually be our first episode of Strange New Worlds we'll be reviewing on this ep- on this uh, season. Very much in keeping, ready to go, just in time for the new season that's kicking off very soon. But we are going to be talking about the season finale of the first season, which is a quality of mercy. Um, a personal highlight of mine, I think, is an absolutely fantastic episode of Star Trek, just outright, outside of Strange New Worlds. I think it's just ex- superbly done. Um, I've waxed the article over it since I watched it and I have not stopped since so we are going to be watching The Quality of Mercy and again very much going back in time um, alternate timelines all this different stuff and very centred around Captain Pike as well so it really is a, a tremendous entry so that's what we're going to be doing there episode 28 is kind of following on the song that's not necessarily on the same vein but we are going to have a good old fashioned time travel story um, and in fact is um, the original time travel story in Star Trek we're going back to the original series and we're watching the city on the edge of forever Um, an episode of the original series that starts off as a script by Harlan Ellison and gets diluted down to something that could be digested by a PG audience (laughs) but it's still an absolutely fabulous episode of Star Trek and a fabulous episode of sci-fi science fiction generally to be absolutely honest um, there was so much more material they could have done into this episode but they packed it all into one very busy hour long episode and uh, we're going to get stuck into it in our 28th episode but then um, as I mentioned the next generation is packed full of time travel episodes um, you have Time's Arrow, you've got Cause and Effect, all these ones but I'm missing that one very big elephant in the room, one big Enterprise C shaped elephant in the room Episode 29 is going to be Yesterday's Enterprise. And uh, if you think that Top Spot is under threat, Jerry, I think there's the next, within the next four episodes, we're going to get some, uh, you don't have to batten the, down the hatches. Yeah. So Enterprise, Yesterday's Enterprise, the story of how the Enterprise C and Tasha Yar got lost in the past um, will be up for review there. And then, as we always do, every 10 episodes, we cap off whatever arcs we've done, whatever series of episodes we've done with a two-parter. And this will be no different. So again, I mentioned Airmark Times Era before, but we've used Next Generation, so it can't be that. So let's dip back into Voyager for time travel. And what better example of time travel 
than the year of hell. The year of hell two-parter is what we're ending this with. So in the next five episodes, we have got the season finale of Strange New Worlds. What many people believe to be the best episode of the original series. What many people believe one of the best episodes of the next generation full stop. And then what I think is comprehensively the best two-parter that Voyager has ever provided. Outside of perhaps the Equinox. Um, and again, the Scorpion can, can be in the conversation as well. But the Year of Hell is almost certainly a blockbuster. So in the next five episodes, we are challenging for the top spots. I think it's fair to say. And there's um, the, the In the Pale Moonlight is going to be threatened, in my opinion. I think we've got some serious contenders there. Yesterday's Enterprise, I'm like, right, okay. It is going to, it's going to be close when it comes to, to top spot. Um, but I'm like, yeah, we'll just we'll we'll mark and we'll see how we get on. But you said Year of Hell, and the the first thing I thought of, how the fuck can I sabotage this? <laughs> <laughs> That's in, the it, question. For yeah. me, for me, in the pale moonlight, if we're not including uh, Picard season three, in the pale moonlight is the quintessential Star Trek best Star Trek episode for me because I had it all, I had everything that you could possibly want. Uh, had that its own unique music the acting was fantastic the writing was fantastic the scenes uh the consequences probably one of the biggest consequences mm. uh in, in, in star yeah. trek just absolutely fantastic but you look at uh yesterday's enterprise and the consequences from that mm-hmm. are just not just as big but almost as big um, had they had they not done what they did in the episode, the Federation would be no more. Exactly, yeah. Federation would be no more. Um, I don't know about consequences in Year From Hell, but listen, no point in scoring it now. We'll watch it and we'll go from there. We'll go from there, exactly. But that is the what that is what to look forward to over the next couple of episodes. Um, because like I said, there are big hitters coming and uh, some very important episodes coming in so hopefully that's whetted your appetite for what is to come on this uh, on the show but for now we're going to leave it there because um, like I said the uh, timeless was indeed not going to challenge the top spots but it was certainly a fun watch nonetheless but um, that means we are done in that aspect and Jerry um, as is tradition um, we invite you to uh, tell us exactly what's going on in the world of Jerry Soul what has been happening with you as of late do you have anything to plug anything to promote by all means, you have the floor, Mr. Mantano. Um, well, I suppose I, I, I haven't actually talked about it yet. Well, I've, I did originally back, back in March. Um, I was one of the hosts uh, for Comic-Con, um, yes. a Dublin Comic-Con, I should say, which was absolutely fantastic. I got, I got to interview some amazing guests. And um, I, kind of, I had kind of pre- preliminary got the nod again for August. Uh, but it wasn't official. There was nothing official about it. But I can officially say now, uh, I have been invited back uh, again for their uh, 10th anniversary uh, Dublin Comic Con in August. Um, the guest list is as long as my arm. Uh, we have, a, 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 I think it's three or four actors from Terminator. Um, oh. Now, uh, in fact, I can't remember their names. Is, is pissing me off as well. Robert Patrick yeah. being the kind of the Rob, first Ro- Ro- Robert Patrick from from Terminator Two. You've got um um. Is it Michael Bean? Michael Bean. Yeah, I think it's Michael Bean, isn't it? Yeah. Michael Bean from the yeah. first one, and then you've got Sarah Connors herself. Yes. Um, uh, again, I can you know the name has escaped me now for for whatever reason. Yeah, you're uh, on the spot, she, so yeah. Linda Ham- Linda Hamilton. There you go, Linda, Linda Hamilton. Hamilton. Yeah. She she's going to be there as well. So an absolutely uh, star-studded lineup, ju- and it's just those three guests together. We have uh, you've you've got Spike from Buffy is going to be, he, and not only is he going to be there, he's going to be back. He's already been Dublin Comic Con before, and he's back by popular demand because people wanted him back. And you're like, let's get him back in. Uh, you have got the actual voice actress uh, who does Ash Ketchum from P- uh, from Pokemon. Uh, she will be there as well, and um, and I, I I I want to say this name. Without, uh, I want to say this person, but by actually knowing their name. Uh, so, if you will indulge me for a second, basically, we we finally, after I think four or five Comic Cons, mm. uh, have 
a, a Star Trek actress, mm. um, uh, Christina Chong. Christina Chong, yeah. Chong, yeah. We're going to have a Christina Chong there, uh, our first Star Trek actor um, since before the pandemic, actually. There you go. That's how long it's been since we have a Star Trek actor. It's there before the pandemic we've had one. Uh, so, Christina, so, so it's, uh, it's, she's, is a cat. Um, what rank it's is La Nguyen, Nguyen Singh, yeah. That's the one, yes. Yeah. So, uh, very excited. I'm hoping that I'll be the one to interview her. Uh, I, I, if if not, it'll be a bit silly considering I'm the, I'm the Star Trek person. Yeah. <laughs> you know? You'd be surprised, uh, but there you go. They're, they're, but the best part is they're not finished uh, mm -hmm. announcing guests, so we might get a few more surprises in there. Well, I know there's more surprises, and uh, the reason I know there's more surprises is because the main man himself told me that there's more surprises and I was like what are they he says well they're a surprise I can't tell you I'm like, <laughs> that's kind of how it works to be fair I, yeah. I'm <laughs> but I'm supposed to be interviewing you can't you no no can't, can't tell you Jerry can't tell you uh, mm -hmm. I, I put it this way I know of certain names that are on his list to get for Comic Con and it, you know I was talking like this to him and uh, when he said some of the names that he wants to get no confirmation that he is getting them, but when he said the names, I went. Oh, uh, sorry, what? Mm. So yes, ex exciting times ahead for for Comic Con in August and for Comic Con uh, March next year. So uh, really, really looking forward to that. I, I I'm really looking forward to be back on stage. Hopefully, I won't be as nervous this time around, but we'll see. Uh, also, as well, I'm back. Uh, I have been back a couple of weeks now, streaming on Twitch. Um, I have. Uh, primarily been streaming uh, Sea of Thieves because it's for me it's the most exciting game to play on Twitch at the minute because uh, you just don't know what's going to happen um, you know you could be doing a mission and all of a sudden you get you get robbed by other pirates or you're going along and you get attacked by a, a Meg it, mm. it's the most exciting thing on it um, people will notice as well as that if you follow me on, on Twitch so it's uh, twitch.tv forward slash Jerry Souls VIP um, if you follow me there, you will see that the stream has changed considerably. I've decided to do a bit of a, a refit uh, on it, so it looks a lot different than you did before. I think it's a little bit newer, it's a little bit fresher, um, better looking. I think it, it it should flow better as well. Um, I have been uh, streaming the last few weeks again. Uh, I will be back on on Tuesdays and Thursdays uh, every week uh, from now. Fingers crossed. Uh, no issues at half nine. So. Uh, 9.30 uh, p.m. GMT uh, I'll be on every Tuesday and Thursday uh, so catch me it is twitch.tv forward slash Jerry Souls VIP uh, and I will be there in each and every week uh, I'll be as I said primarily doing Sea of Thieves but we'll have a smattering of other things we might see a bit of Star Wars you might see a bit of Star Trek you might see a bit of Command and Conquer in there as well uh, so yes yeah, so if you can give us, give us a follow and uh, I'll see you on Tuesday Thursday yeah, absolutely. And uh, I don't have anything to promote here because uh, I think I say this every single time, but you probably see the death of me on this uh, Nerds Rose channel at this stage. Um, but that's what happens when you're the producer and the editor of the channel. <laughs> I kind of Produ up Produ really. Producer, editor, writer, everything. Et al. Yeah, I suppose. I mean, technically, I directed you to, 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 to consent to this video as well. So, technically, director as well. But yeah, anyway, you're sick to death of me at this stage, so I have nothing to promote. But um, by all means, subscribe to the channel, subscribe to Nerds Rus, and uh, support all that we do here. Um, we've got tons of uh, videos on the channel for you. If you're not into Star Trek in particular, but you just enjoyed our banter, we have tons of other stuff available. We do a lot of wrestling uh, uh, re uh, videos as well, whether it be playthroughs of, um, of the games. We also have a new series starting off very, very soon um, that uh, you will hopefully get your teeth sunk into there as well. We're also starting to revamp our comic section as well. That's hopefully going to uh, uh, get people very, very intrigued as well. And of course, we have all these other different things that we're doing, like our uh, wrestling RPG. You can look back at the first few seasons of it and look forward to what we have coming very, very soon uh, in that department. More on that story, hopefully, uh, coming uh, very, very soon at, in the summer. And then we also have all of our bits and pieces, our movie watch alongs, our podcasts, and everything else that we do in between. And we got plenty of stuff there to cater to any and potential audiences. So by all means, give us a like, subscription, comments. By all means, we want to hear from you all out there in the YouTube verse. But uh, for the time being, 
Uh, thank you all very much for your company tonight on another episode of Best of All Worlds. Hopefully you agree with our score, but if not, by all means, let us know in the comments. Do we underscore? Do we overscore? Let us know. We want to hear from you. And uh, again, we after a couple of episodes, we will need suggestions. We want to find out what you want us to review on this, uh, uh, on this series. So by all means, chime down what you would like us to touch next on this um, on this magical uh, venture through the stars. But for now, Jerry, it's been a pleasure. And as always, on this episode, on the series, we wish you all the best in the only way we know how. <laughs> Amen.